How are you? <laughs> Josie. Hi. Josie. Nice, nice, to, nice to have your acquaintance again. Oh, thank you. Of course. Don't push my hair for it. It's okay. <laughs> How you doing, bro? Very good. Thank good you very you, much. Man. Same here. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our artist here. It is an artist that has been a mainstay in the street art and graffiti movement since the 1970s. His career has spanned over five decades. And so we are ecstatic here at WCC to be able to have this conversation with all of you and with our artist, Al Diaz, today. Now let's give a big round of applause for Al Diaz. Thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate the nice crowd. And thank you, thank you for being here. And I think the first question that, that I want to know is really just your background. So maybe we just start off there. How did you grow up? Tell us a little bit more about you. And then we'll get into the artwork and some of the influences on your artwork as well. So I was born here in Manhattan. I was born in the Lower East Side. I grew up in um, Jacob Reese houses uh, on, the, on the FDR Drive, Avenue D, um, back in the 60s. My folks. Uh, immigrated here in the 50s from Puerto Rico during the mass migration. Um, Puerto Rico was suffering poverty heavily, so they came here for a better life. And um, without going into every detail of, of, of their struggle, they have actually changed their, their lives and our lives in the, the 180 degrees. They, they realized the American dream. They, you know, they went back and they owned property in Puerto Rico, here in Brooklyn. Uh, my, my, my younger brother ended up going to Harvard. We grew up in the projects, and my sister is a, a professional uh, executive assistant. We all we all ended up like you know doing doing uh, you know living a fairly comfortable lives after struggling. Our, we lived in the Lower East Side during the, the during the sixties and seventies, which was a very um, tough time in New York City. It's really tough. Um, we went to Catholic school. It was uh, kind of like the, the, the uh, poor person's uh, private school, but uh, it was. I mean, it was a lot, a lot safer and a lot better than going to, to the public schools, which were basically, you know, like uh, prisons that you, you went to for, uh, for the day and then went home afterwards. Um, so yeah, I lived in the Lower Side till I was about 15. And my folks, at that point, it had become fairly uh, intolerable. Like, I mean. My father had a, a meat cleaver put to his neck for a, for a, for a gold watch. My mother was followed into the. They were they, they starting to fear for our lives. It was pretty dangerous, and I was getting in, into trouble. At, you know, at that time, I, I had already I started writing graffiti when I was 12, um, so I had already been involved in graffiti. 
city by the time we moved to Brooklyn. But um, we, they moved us out to Brooklyn, and, and uh, that, you know, that was a different struggle out there. It was, a, it was kind of a working blue collar neighborhood. Brooklyn was very territorial at that time. It was real, you know, racist, very segregated in terms of like, you know, kids chasing other kids out of the neighborhood. I, I remember seeing some of the, some of the guys, I, I, I had befriended some, some people who were writing graffiti because we connected on that level and I realized that these guys were not very tolerant of other people. They would like throw bottles at, at like the Hasidic kids that were coming because the, the neighborhood conjoined with Borough Park, which is a, a, a big Jewish uh, neighborhood. And they would be throwing little kids, you know, throwing bottles at them. And it was just, it became, you know, it became clear that these were not my people either. So I was, you know, this, these are friendships based on graffiti writing. So, I mean, I, at one point I remember bringing Jean-Michel to that neighborhood and one of the kids asked me, yo, oh, what are you hanging out with niggas now? You know, it was that, that type of Brooklyn, Brooklyn, uh, that was the flavor of Brooklyn back then. <laughs> There's a couple of Brooklyn people here who I, I see can relate to that. Um, so, so yeah, I, uh, getting back to, to growing up, I went to high school. I went to high school of, the, of art and design first. So after after uh, eight years of Catholic school, I went to here in, in uh, Midtown to the high school of art and design, where I stayed for three years. And because of my involvement in graffiti as a bomb one. I, uh, I, I, I gradually flunked out, basically, because I was not really much doing much going to school. I was, you know, a truant, basically spending most of his time painting trains, meeting my, uh, my friends there, and then leaving to go, to go do graffiti stuff. So they, um, they uh, basically asked me to leave to find, to find another school, which, which I, I ended up at City as a school at the Experimental um, alternative high school, where that's where I met Jean Michel, and that's where, where the whole same old thing was created. Okay, so I want to get into the same old story as well, but just backing it up a little bit to the graffiti writing. So I'm sure a lot of you are pretty well versed with street art and graffiti, but just to give you a little background, it was essentially a group of kids, teenagers, from about age, you know, maybe 12 to 16. Uh, but teenagers that started this whole movement of graffiti, and it started by writing their name or a nickname and a number that was significant, so maybe a street address or a number that was significant. Maybe the number one, for example, if they were the first, because they were the first generation during that time, and Al was a part of that. And so your name was Bomb One, right. right? So maybe give us a little background on that. And also I'm curious about the experience during that time, what it was like running around with these kids and starting what is now known as a, a new art movement. So, so yeah, so it, when I was 12 years old, I, I, I had been going up to Washington Heights, which is northern Manhattan. Um, the Lower East Side was not what you would call a graffiti center. There was no real, um, like subway style graffiti there, it was gang stuff, but you didn't really see these t what we call tag, right, or, or uh, graffiti culture stuff. So I, um, my cousin was friends with, with some of the pioneers like Snake One, Stitch One, Coco 144, Spanky 132, Cat 87. These guys that were, were that created Writer's Corner 188, the wall writers, they were the first generation of, of, of serious uh, graffiti artists. People that made this turn this into a lifestyle, into a, a subculture, created a language for it, had a way of, of dressing it. And um, I was really impressed with these guys. I'm 12 years old, I'm looking for an identity. I'm like, these guys are cool, I want to be like these guys. And I ended up in exporting, importing it from Washington Heights to the Lower East Side. There was no nobody else doing it over there. Eventually, uh, other people, there was two other guys, Manmaker and Mr. Death, a, a duo that were also hanging out. They were up there hanging out in, in Harlem, and there were two cousins that lived in in the Lower East Side and traveled back and forth. So that's really how people were importing it to other neighborhoods was learning from, from learning about it from this area and then bringing it bringing it to to where you live, and and that's how it spread. And then you know. So it was, it was about camaraderie, it was about competition, it, 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 it uh, offered a sense of adventure, it was a completely delinquent activity. There was nothing 
It was not like we were going out to make art. That, that, that didn't enter the conversation. The art factor gradually grew with, with the, comp the competitive factor of making your name stand out from someone else's name looking nicer. Um, also, the, the, the amount of times that you, I mean, you wanted to see, volume was, was very important. You wanted to see it everywhere. But it was ego-fueled uh, or, or uh, it was about, you know, being proud of seeing your name everywhere and other people seeing it. It was more of a sport, in a sense, as opposed to an artistic uh, endeavor. But yes, gradually, with people, you know, making their names more elaborate and, and, and nice to look at, it sort of evolved into what would become a, a, a recognized as, a, as a, a art form. But the, earl the earliest um, uh, rendition or, or uh, you know, uh, form of, of graffiti culture, New York City graffiti culture was very crude. If you look at you look at books like John Nars, The Faith of Graffiti, by comparison to today's graffiti, it was very, you know, basic. So, but that was really what it offered, was, was a sense of camaraderie, a sense of, of competition. There was rivalry, there was, you know, there was fist fights, there was all kinds of stuff that is, that goes with the territory of being, grown, growing up as a, as, a, as a young man in New York City, especially during that generation, you know. It was not for the squeamish, Running through subway tunnels was extremely exciting, and you know, painting these huge trains that are parked, that are you know, that any any moment can start up, and it was it was danger, there was excitement, there was you know, and delinquency too, because because everything was, what, what every aspect of it would get you arrested. So that that was a, a very alluring and very um, enticing kind of uh, element to the to the uh, to the whole thing, the whole experience. Yeah, so another so that kind of leads us into SAMO as well. So for graffiti artists and, and when they would tag their name, as Al mentioned, it was more for other art or graffiti artists. So it was more for them to see who had their name more places, how high it could be, how big it could be, how creative it could be. And then from there, when they started tagging SAMO, and we'll kind of get into that story here in a second, but SAMO is no longer a tag. It's not to represent any particular person, but it was more, as Al will describe it, as a product. And it was something that was unique and something that was different. And the way I see it is really almost as a segue into street art. So street art is more so for the public. It's meant for everyone. It's meant for everyone to see, and it's not necessarily meant for just other graffiti artists like the tags were. And so Samo is really kind of that, that um, bridge between graffiti writers and tagging and going moving into street art. So maybe you can tell us a little more about that, about the story behind the same one. Right. Um, so, yeah, graffiti, the street writers have been writing graffiti for other graffiti writers. It was a very inside thing. That's one of the, another one of the charms and allure was that you felt like you were part of a secret organization. You know, like this is our thing. And it was for us, by us, and we were writing for each other. It wasn't, you weren't trying to get somebody's mom to notice, you know, you're, you're getting your, your buddies to notice and say, oh, that dude's got style, that guy's up, that guy's cool, whatever. And what happened was, like, back, back up a second, when I, when I met Jean-Michel in 1976, he, was, he had transferred from another school as well. He had been going, well, he had a, a bunch of schools he had been to, and the last school he had been to, I think, was was um, Edward R. Murrow, which is a pretty good school in Brooklyn. Uh, but he was not a member of graffiti culture. He had no experience with it. He, he, he came from a, a more middle class family and he probably was not exposed to that kind of, of activity where, you know, with his friends or at, at his school or whatever. And um, it didn't start out as a, completely as a graffiti project. Same old, was it was a it was a word that we were using. It's just an expression of same old, same old, same old shit, whatever. But by the time that it became this, it had nothing to do with same old shit. So one of the things I, I need to always clear up is that when people who write about same old, they write that it stands for same old shit. It does not. It was the name of a it was a, a, a product name given to a religion, and the story was that. Jean, we, we were part of a school newspaper. This is a little convoluted, but bear with me. We, we, we were writing, 
we were writing and drawing for our school newspaper. Anyone who has gone to see King Pleasure will see a bunch of that stuff laid out in the showcase when you first enter. They have all these, these pages from the school newspaper that we did. And um, in one issue, it was the, the issue was in January of 1978, and Jean-Michel, who was a very gifted writer as well, he was just plain smart. He was a brilliant kid. Um, we had become, by then, we, we had been uh, friends for over a year. By, I met him in, in late 76 and by 70, or early 78, yeah, like o over a year. So he, he wrote this, this really funny little story for the newspaper about a guy who was selling religions. He had a kiosk above like Papaya King where, he, where the guy was selling religions <laughs> in like the two for one Buddhist sale, right? <laughs> and and the, the, by, by the end it was very funny. And it, it was, the premise was that Samo was, was, uh, was, was a, uh, a, a guilt-free religion that you could do whatever you wanted here. And, and, and when you got to the pearly gates, just say that you didn't know. So you, you claim, claim ignorance. It was very funny. So, um, so, uh, so, so, so we also added a pamphlet that we, that we ended up giving out to people on the street with drawings of people who had experienced SAMO and it had changed their lives. They were testimonials. And it was just, it was just a, you know, comics, like I mean, cartoon stuff that we had done. And we were handing it out on the street, and we thought it was hilarious. But at the, there was also, during the 70s, this is a side note, there were two religious graffiti that were being spread around. And that was Pray and Jesus Saves. And, and, we, and, and I thought, I mean, coming from, at this point, I had sort of like slowed down with my graffiti activity. Because I you know, was in a different school. It was. It had already gotten me into trouble. I was. I was getting old. I was chasing girls, smoking weed, and doing stuff that that would take away from from my. But graffiti would take away from that. So so I had to slow down. And but this offered a new a new opportunity. It it, it, it same old was this product now because he had now it, it came it, it, it transformed from just this word that we were using into an actual product. It was a religion. So the, the idea what we had grown up during the, the 60s when it, you know advertising had, had exploded. So we were weaned on television and, and advertisements and all that stuff. So this was in our heads already. So it, we became like, like ad men. You know, we were running this idea of selling this product that didn't really exist. But SAMO was like something that could change your life, it could improve your, it, it could be a religion, it could be a pill or something, and it would change your life for the better. It was, you know, same as an, an, an alternative to God, same uh, um, as an end to bourgeois fantasies, um, bogus philosophies and, and nowhere politics, same as an end to mass-produced individuality. So it, it's offered all these, and, and at the same time, with this product, we were able to make these social uh, commentaries, things that we were noticing, which was, when I think about it, and I, I'm not trying to, I'm not full of myself or, or, or bragging, but it was pretty clever for a couple of teenagers. Yeah. So, so that's what we were doing. And, it, and I, I thought it would make a, a brilliant a graffiti campaign because, well, I was an experienced graffiti artist, and I, that's one, one thing I knew quite well. And so it just so happens that the guy who's, who, who I, I um, borrowed the, the uh, ellipsis, this is, people ask me, what is those three, three strokes? It's a stylized dot, dot, dot. That's what it means, like same old dot, dot, dot. And I think Jean-Michel added the copyright, because that seems like something he would do, right? That's very busty. And so it became this brand, same old dot, dot, dot. And, and, they, and I borrowed that from Flint, da, 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 who happens to be sitting right there. He's one of the earliest uh, Brooklyn writers. Flint, stand up. Ah. <laughs> so that's where that's where it started, and 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 then uh, I mean it was just we got really excited and, and started to it's, it it started to spread, and, and uh, I had a girlfriend on on Leonard Street in Tribeca, and we spent a lot of time there. And, and then we had friends, of course, in the East Village. I mean, we had, people, were, people right out of high school were getting apartments for like $350 for, 
for on, on, on the Lower East Side. So we were we were we were traveling from Tribeca through Soho, through the West Village, Chinatown to the East Village or the Lower East Side. So that's the territory that we covered with with the same old writing, especially Soho because we wanted. It, at, at some point, we, we started to become conscious that maybe we should target the art, the art uh, galleries, and just to have art people notice it. Because, like, once again, this was not graffiti for other graffiti artists. This was our ad campaign. This was advertorial, and it was an exercise in hype. We were learning how to how to be um, madmen, you know, and and uh, and. We actually succeeded quite well, I might think. Um, but uh, yeah, so that that territory was was, was our um, our our route, and it wasn't all over the place like you read, like it was everywhere. It was more, it was focused and concentrated in downtown Manhattan. Uh, the other thing is because of of, of my uh, being exposed to to Tribeca during the seventies. We were we became aware of art parties and and that whole scene at a very young age. I, I had a job working as a a bartender basically. I wasn't really a bartender, but I would give out drinks at, at art openings. And at this one particular uh, gallery that I worked at had always had top shelf booze. So I would always pack a box for myself bring it downstairs in the freight elevator and have Jean-Michel waiting downstairs so we would have our own party afterward. <laughs> and uh, that's, yeah, that's it, some of the stuff we engaged in. Um, but, um, but yeah, so we, so we became exposed to that world very young. I, I, 19, 19 it, it, he was 17, 18, I was 19, and we were already going to art parties and, and doing that sort of stuff, so, solo art parties. And, and that's really where, uh, I guess he, I mean, he, Jean-Michel wanted to be an artist from a very young age. That, there's no mystery about that. But now it became a very clear and, and um, attainable thing. And it was, it was through Samo that he, uh, well, that's where the conflict comes in. It's because by the end, so, so we have this thing, and we've done it throughout the, the whole year of 1978. Um, by, by, the, by December 11th, 1978, the, the, the Village Voice prints an article, which is still, I mean, easily available. You can look it up. It's about, it was Philip Fafflick. We got paid $50 a piece to do this, to do this interview explaining what this, because everybody was, I mean, by this time, within a year, within a year, that's very successful. We, we have captured the, uh, like the local media. And they want to know who Samo is, what the Samo stuff is. and. Uh, I was a, a bit opposed to, to, to doing it because because of, of it, it seemed like once we did that it would be over. I mean, once you out yourself like that, it's like what's the point of doing it anymore? Because the the anonymity was was kind of the exciting um, a big excitement a, a big part of the excitement. Anyway, um, so yeah, and, and by this time you know I, I've already graduated school and we're, we're starting to part ways in, in, on other levels. Um, Getting a little tired of each other, two big egos in the room, not good. Um, so, by '79, you know, after that whole thing, we had a, a bunch of, of, of uh, arguments and stuff like that. Jean Michel had the opportunity; he just found himself at a party and, and with the the, uh, the Canal Zone party that you see that we've all heard. I, I don't know if you guys have, but it's, it's, it's Michael Holman explaining how, how, how uh, Samo comes to the party. So by then, Jean-Michel started to, to identify himself as Samo. And remember that Samo was never supposed to be a person, or it, it was a product. And that's where the whole history gets skewed, you know? And it, it did, it got skewed. And a lot of people would, Referred. I mean, after that, without people who never had never seen a Samo graffiti in their lives, would refer to him as Samo as if it were his nickname, and it was never anybody's nickname. It was this this product. And um, eventually, so fast forward, Jean Michel, you know, finally drops it. He wrote, "Samo is dead." To, to just wash his hands of it because I guess he wanted to move on to other things, and he wanted to sort of apologize. We hadn't spoken to each other for a year and a half. 
And, and it was just like, okay, enough with the same old stuff. And then he moved on and, and did his thing, and, and we all know that he, he was very, extremely successful. Um, I went in different directions. I started playing music during the 80s. I played on, on Jean-Michel called me in 1983 to play on, on Ram LZ's record. I, I did all the, the Whiplock stuff that, that, that's been sampled many, many times on Beat Bop, Ram LZ's record, Ram LZ versus k -Bop. Um But uh, yeah, and I, I did a bunch of, I played with Liquid Liquid, I did a, a bunch of musical stuff while, while Jean-Michel was, was, you know, climbing the ladder to success. But it was the same old graffiti that he that first caught his his that that brought attention to him uh, in the art scene because it had some local fame. It wasn't this huge thing, and and, and it, in turn it ended up kind of skewing the the, the history. So what I, what I meant by fast forward was in 2016, long long after Samo was you know was had been a thing, I decided that it was time to to. Uh, to teach the world what Samo was, because I, I realized there was a, a two generations that had never seen a Samo graffiti, and were not quite clear of what that is. It was Jean-Michel's nickname. No, it wasn't. It was th these uh, politically charged or socially uh, social commentary graffitis that we did, and I, I did that for for about I, I I did them on the subway this time, which as opposed to the street. For, from 2016 till the beginning of 2019, when I got arrested for it, the uh, vandal squad actually called me up on the, on my phone. So they they, they they might be here tonight take collecting <laughs> business cards. Anyway, but I just pulled this out. Anyway, but but uh, so yeah, so I had to get I had to get a criminal lawyer. I mean, I didn't do it any time. I, I, I spent the day in, in jail. I, I, I gave myself up. They handcuffed me, took put me in the system, paid my lawyer a couple of thousand dollars to get me out of there, and um, and that was it. And then, and then, my 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 second coming of Samo was over. But I, I did um, re uh, reestablish the history and and explain to to uh, to a new generation what's what. What Samo looked like, what Samo was saying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this has is never any disrespect to, to my colleague, my my past colleague Jean Michel, but I think that it was really important for people to understand what Samo was. Yeah, and I think a lot of people were really influenced by that even today, seeing it in the subways. Um, and I'm curious as well how it feels to know what an influence that you've had on other artists, and and when these artists come to you and maybe they started creating graffiti or, or art, and they were all influenced by you. Um, how does that feel? Well, it artist? feels like when, when there's younger people, or any people, who are you know, grateful for what you've contributed to, to urban culture, it feels like it's all, it's, it was worth the effort. You know what I mean? All worth the effort. Absolutely. And then, in, in, along with that question, who were your influences as an artist? Well, you know what? It's funny. Be, I mean, I, I love all. I mean, Russian constructivism, impressionism, abstract expressionism. I like so much art that I don't have any particular one favorite. You know, that just doesn't exist to me. The one, who's your favorite? Anything. I listen to all kinds of music, but it, it in terms of, of what I do because I because I do a lot of visual writing is I I'm inspired by a lot of of um, people like. Charles Bukowski, Tom Waits, Jim Morrison, writers, people that write Bob Dylan, you know, from my generation, people that, that wrote powerful messages and made social commentary. And that use, the using language is, is, is one of the things that motivates me. Before the image is the language, the idea, the idea to express, which is really what I've been doing for a long time. The web paint series, is an extension of Samo, you know, because I it's, I'm motivated to always to always uh, say stuff and, and and to use language. I mean, I was raised bilingual, and that really what it, one of the things we don't even realize that being bilingual does is it gives you it, 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 you develop a, a value system for language because you you're you're in it. You, you do do it in in, in Two different ways, at least two different ways. Some people are three or four, I don't know, seven different languages. 
which it makes it a value, uh, something that you value. And um, that becomes important to me, and it, it has since I think since I was a little kid. Um, I remember I had I had a poem published when I was in the third grade. You know that that's inspiring to a kid. <laughs> you know. And look where you come from there. <laughs> Pretty fascinating. Would you mind going through and maybe just giving us a little background on the specific works that we have behind us sure. here? Maybe starting on that side and then ending with our prints on this side. Yeah, yeah that's that photo. This this piece here. This is a one of the rare. The photographer is unknown. I think I know who it was, but she, she passed. Um, but I, I'm not sure that. And he's a, a rare, rare photograph from one day um, in '78. And and Jean were followed by by this photographer. And we see here we are on West Broadway, sitting in front of Samo, Samo for you, and, and Jean drew the, the, the this before he was doing those the the, the the type of art he's known for. He was doing this kind of psychedelic sort of post uh, Peter Max sort of you know, kind of star stuff and all that. Anyway, so this is us sitting on a car seat. West Broadway was not West Broadway as you know it today. It's not like Prada. It was like a lot of people would pull up their car and like change the auto parts and leave the auto parts there and keep going. And that's a couple of, there was some good galleries there, but it was pretty still pretty, pretty funky. The side streets were all like still sweatshops and a lot of skids and pieces of fabric everywhere, nuts and bolts. It was still kind of industrial. And this is just a, a, a photograph of us sitting, sitting on somebody's car seat, sharing a cigarette. People are like, what, what are you having to make as a cigarette? <laughs> and I played around with it the way I cut it and, and, and repeated that pattern in those candy kind of juicy colors. And on this, this is a this is a a, a, a work of, this is a blown up um, collage that I do. I do these cityscape collages, and uh, this is the first one to be really made large. Um, this is with the help of, of my colleague Gary Lichtenstein, a master screen print maker, who's sitting right there, an excellent uh, teacher and and associate, and. And it's about, this is really about, I mean, this, this is either the Lower East Side or Spanish Harlem. It's a, it's a tenement. It's, it's, and I mean, my grandmother, we, we didn't have this because we, we grew up in the projects. But like in my, behind my grandmother's tenement, you would see, see like people hanging their, their laundry. It was like the, the, the flag of the poor, you know? And, uh, and then, but these are mirrored images, and it's, uh, you know, I've extended it so that it, there's no real place like this. It's only a piece of it. And then I threw some, like, that's the tower on 6th Avenue by, by, uh, by uh, 10th Street over there. So I think that Blackbird. So it's just, it's just this made up cityscape. And, then, and it's, uh, it's screen printed on top, of, on top of this fabric. I don't want to go into the, the, the technical aspects of it, but it's a few layers. To ghosts, because the names and faces fade as time passes, a familiar sense remains. Which is, you know, it's about it's about memory, it's about uh, nostalgia, it's about melancholy, and growing up. I mean, I, I happen to be extremely New York centric. I, I'm very proud to be from New York, and, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of my friends and family are because we are real New York, <laughs> true York. Um, and yeah, and this is mostly screen print. If you could touch a little bit on the subway letters and the wet paint letters, letters. These letters are, I have a constrained alphabet I work with. It's not a full alphabet. It's uh, the, the train letters and the wet paint signs. Wet paint, I, I use, I, there's seven characters in a wet paint sign. The T appears twice, so it doesn't count. It only counts once. So, if, but if you, per, if you turn the W upside down, it turns into an M. And if you use the, uh, the P upside down, it says lowercase d. So that, and then there's the, the shuttle, the C train, the R train. All these are, are train letters. I use, uh, there's a U that I use, which is a turnaround symbol. And I use the no re-entry sign, which is a red red thing with a slash through it, as an O. Because it kind of looks like an O. Like most people read it as an O. So it's a constraint, it's a one-legged race. And at this point, I've become kind of good at this, if I say so myself. I want to, 
There's something I'd like to read. I think I have it with me. I'll find, if not, I'll find it. But, yeah. This is what I, because at this point, with those letters, I could, I, could, I, could, I could write about just about anything. You would think that with a constrained alpha, it's an actual dis writing discipline, it's called constrained writing. It's like, a, like I said, a one-legged race. Yeah, here's a, here's a, a writing I did about a sculpture, about a sculpture, of, uh, a set of sculptures that I, I made that were geometric shapes. So it's just about the circle, the, the form the circle. The circle is considered most perfect of all forms in its, a, 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 a circle is considered most perfect of all forms. It is omnipresent can illustrate notions of God, total self, a process of transformation, and timelessness. And that's just with those letters, which is pretty good, I think. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's what I do with the This is from that same day. This is a, uh, us in an in a alley, but a dark, not an alleyway. It's, it's, it's a doorway, actually. This, this particular screen print was done by Doug Group, who's sitting over there. Um, and it's uh, it's just the it's just the quality of the photograph. It's just, it, it, I got these as, as photocopies. So to make copies of photocopies is to get this image is, is is pretty pretty crafty because it's a poor image to start with. Not there's nothing high res about about the source. You know? But this was part of that. That was that same day that, that we got uh, you know we, we were photographed by this person. And it's another, you know, it's just a composition, and this one has the same, the same old background. Just, uh, it's just that these two paintings were done. They, they were done for, for uh, beyond the streets, the the, the uh, quintessential street art graffiti show. That's that's the started. The first one was in L.A. Then it came to Brooklyn a couple of years ago. Uh, it's Roger Gaspin's production. Anyway, so I've been, in, in, you know, I've, I've been able to, to be part of, of, of Beyond the Street since, since the first one. And they invited me to the, the current one, which was in Shanghai. And so I started working on these pieces because they wanted, they wanted the same old related pieces. And then, uh, so as I'm working on them, and, and you know, it cost me some money to get the screen printed done and all that. And I'm trying to make them sizable so that, they, you know, they wanted a, a certain size painting and everything. And then every like couple of like I don't know every every e every other email from them was like uh, they're getting a little you know they started squeezing like they said and it wasn't it wasn't the fault of, of Beyond the Streets it was the Shanghai committee that were they were kind of sent them not kind of they were censoring everything so um, eventually I found out that they didn't want any images of, of first of all Samo there was very few Samos I could use that weren't going to be offensive to them. Other than same old for you, because it's, it's kind of benign. But um, finally, I heard that I couldn't use an image of Jean Michel. So I was just like, you know what? Stop the you know, stop the presses. We're not going to go forward with this. So as a result, and and it was all ended up very clean with with, with beyond the streets. I just told Roger, well, listen, Roger, I can't do this. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this because one, I'm gonna finish these pieces. They're gonna go over there and then they're gonna reject them and then I'm gonna be asked out. So I was not willing to do that. And he said, no problem, wait for the next one. So, so that's, these, and these two pieces ended up being titled Banned in China. So, I love that. They were basically Banned in China. And it's really nice for art collectors to have that history behind the artwork and get to know that, you know, it was, ended up being banned in China, but now you could actually own one of these works of art because these works are for sale and it has an impeccable provenance coming directly from the artist. And having that story behind the artwork, I think, is something really special as well. This brown piece is, uh, is another, this is a photocopy thing that I've done. These are whales. This is a whale. A whale, I, I found this, I was like scrolling through my, my social media one day. And there's an image of this whale that's beached somewhere in Southeast Asia. And his, he's been rotting on the beach for I don't know how long. But he has become a dumpster for plastic. And I was so disgusted by that that I said, I want to do something about that. I mean, like, at least make a piece of art about it. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a you know, he's reversed. It's kind of yin and yang of uh, this sort of uh, central image with the plastic stuff sticking out of it, coming out of his mouth, which I find extremely disturbing. 
And it's very hard to sell a piece like this, but I'm glad that I made this piece. Um, Cause that's, and then I wrote, I, I couldn't even figure out something profound enough to write. So I went to Revelation. And once again, I'm not a religious guy, but this is, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Which is kind of like, makes me shudder a little bit. But that's how, I, that's how I feel when I see things like a whale, you know, being used as a dumpster on a beach. And that's the world we live in. Uh, accept, uh, embrace, celebrate imperfection was done for, for a show that I had with Padilla and, and Dave Navarro down in Austin thanks to West, West uh, Chelsea Contemporary. And these are the posters that we had uh, worked on together, along with Gary Lichtenstein. And uh, I think they're quite beautiful. We do have merch available on the other side. So his book, or you can read more about what he's been talking about today in his book here, which is available for sale. These prints here are also available for sale. And I'm sure if you ask really nicely, he'd dedicate them to you. Another uh, thing that I think is important to cover is your story in between. We're at the end of Samo, and you know where we are today, and, and making that comeback, and you know maybe just talking a little bit about what you've overcome in those years, because I think it's a really powerful motivation for people that may be going through something now, just to show that you know you can come out on the other side, you can make this powerful comeback, and I think it's just important to kind of touch on that. So. So after, okay, so, so, so it's the 1980s, and so I got, I got married in 85. I, I, was, I was playing music throughout the early 80s. I, um, I'm traveling, I did a lot of traveling. Me and my ex-wife did a lot of traveling. We traveled through the Andes, we traveled through Central America. We had a, a, a house that we rented year-round in Mexico and Chiapas. So I was doing a lot of backpack, rough, rough real, like, you know, adventure uh, traveling while the uh, New York art scene was going on. I was kind of away from that, but I playing music when I was, and working in, as a carpenter in construction. So by the end of the 80s, I had, you know, I, I had been, traveled quite a bit. I'd been to Costa Rica a few times, and I had monkeys throwing uh, pits at me, you know. It, it's just wonderful stuff, stuff that I knew that I wanted to do before I got too old to do it, you know. I, I traveled a lot, and I saw all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, as it, and then the 90s came, and by the 90s, after Jean-Michel died, I, you know, I got divorced. My, my life started to spiral downward. Uh, throughout the 90s, I, I found myself strung out on heroin and, and, and uh, IV drug use, and I spent, uh, I would end up, you know, up and down, up and down, you know, trying to get out, out of that. I spent 19 years uh, struggling with heroin and cocaine addiction and alcoholism and all the rest of that stuff. And by then, people had been dropping left and right. Uh, Keith died. Uh, Jean-Michel was already was dead in, by, by 88. Um, and um, it, was, it wasn't until uh, 2010 that I, I had gone to a screening for Radiant Child with uh, Tamara Tam 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 Davis' uh, uh, film. And I saw myself and I was like, I don't look good. Um, and besides that, people were coming up to me and they wanted to talk to me. And I, I was like, well, I was kind of embarrassed. I was like, shit, I, you know, I don't look good. And, and, but I guess I was already tired of myself. I mean, I figured, listen, I couldn't even kill myself right at this point. I did almost 20 years trying to kill myself and I failed. So maybe I should, I should try something else. And there were people that wanted to talk to me. And I, I like, hey, what, you know, tell us about this and that and the other thing. So I said, well, I changed my life around. And I was, I guess, blessed. Um, I'm not a very religious person, but, but there was some magic there. And I turned my life around. And by, within a year, I, I, you know, I, I, went to, I, went, I went to like the, the hardcore uh, therapeutic community of, of state, you know, which is like an alternative to jail, really. But you're surrounded, you know, surrounded by other drug addicts, and and I spent a year doing that, and then I decided that, you know, I was never going to be back there again, and my life, you know, I've, I've just kept going going forward since then. And yes, it is. It, it's a testament to the fact that you know we we can we can spin our life. if you're alive, there's if it, if, where there's hope and there's life, there's you know you can you can do it. 
and I did that, and I'm here, you know, to. to